Let's go to John 16, 13 to see that we truly, truly depend on the Spirit and need the Holy Spirit to fill us. <clears throat> because everything good comes from His grace. Everything imperfect comes from us, right? But in John 16, 13, whoever wants to read, read it aloud for me so that others can hear. In John 16, 13, our beloved Master, our blessed Lord says, the Holy Spirit comes to do something in specific. And by the way, if you want to know your spirit film, you will know it by how much you glorify Jesus Christ. Let me repeat it again. People think being filled with the Spirit is to speak about the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is to glorify Jesus Christ. Because that's what the Spirit does through believers. And that's what Jesus says in John 16, 13. Someone read it out loud for me, please. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. All the way to 15. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me. He'll do what? He shall glorify me. So if you want to know your spirit filled, you will glorify Jesus Christ. For he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. <clears throat> Some of these passages move me in my spirit. Because here the Lord says something beautiful. All that the Father has are mine. Whatever the Father owns belongs to me. Every one of us belongs to the Father. That means every one of us belongs to Jesus. He owns us. That's why I love verse 15. Did you catch what he said? All things. Read that one more time. Verse 15. See how beautiful, how majestic our Lord is. What does he say in 15? All things that the Father has are mine. No. Therefore... I said that he takes of mine. May the Spirit take that and just etch it in our hearts. We belong to Jesus. He owns us. We live and breathe because of Jesus. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to make you aware that you exist for Jesus. And your life must bring him glory. Our utmost for his eyes. Because you saw what 14 says, right? He will not he, he, he will not speak on his own initiative. That's 13. But he will only speak what he hears, and he will glorify me. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. Even your confession that Jesus is Lord, if it's a confession from the heart that results in a transformed life of obedience, that too is the work of the Holy Spirit. So he gets credit for that in your life. From beginning to end, it's the Holy Spirit. From beginning to end, it's the Holy Spirit working in us and through us to bring us to Christ to attach us to Christ, to transform us to be like Christ. We cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. Right? In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, what does it say? Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is a, is a curse, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So can you confess Jesus is Lord from your heart, if it's not from the Holy Spirit prompting you, leading you, and enabling you? No, you can. You see how important the Holy Spirit is in our life? And that's why when I said, I need the Spirit, I mean it. Because I know the Bible is true. And apart from the Spirit, I cannot do this. My arguments can't make anyone a Christian. It has to be the Holy Spirit using what I say to open hearts to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit does use His servants and does use apologetics. Because the Holy Spirit prescribed apologetics as a method of evangelism. It's in the New Testament. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Brother, you look very familiar. Have we ever seen each other before? Yeah. You were never in Chicago in the Promised Land? All right, it's okay. You're forgiven. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Apologetics is not an option. It's a command given by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Peter. Now, as Christians, we believe that Peter is not giving us his opinion. He's writing as he's guided by the Holy Spirit. That's our belief, our conviction. If you don't believe that, then we got issues because we believe that the 66 books of the Bible, I know the Catholics have 73, another group has 81. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church have 81 books in their Bible. One of those books is the book of Enoch. They believe that's inspired scripture. Ask me about the significance of Enoch a little later because that does play a role in our understanding of Jesus as the Son of Man. But for us Christians who believe the 27 books of the New Testament, we do not believe that these people are giving us our opinions. They're telling us what the Holy Spirit wants the church to know and act upon. 
So this exhortation, chapter 3, verse 15, is a command not just to the elders of the church, but to every member of the body of Christ who's filled with the Spirit and loves Jesus more than this world. And here's the exhortation. 1 Peter 3.15, how does it begin the exhortation? Now we're catching it in midstream. For the sake of time, I can't read the entire context. There is a particular context to this exhortation. But to make my point, all I need is verse 15. What does it say? But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you. Pause right there. Always be ready to do what? The word defense in Greek is apologia. It's actually pros apologia. Does that sound familiar? Apologia? Apologetics? Apologist? That's where we get this word from, from that Greek term. If I were to paraphrase what Peter's saying, always be ready to do the work of an apologist. Always be ready to engage in apologetics, because that's the word. Apologia, we get the word apologetics from it. And so here, the Holy Spirit is telling Peter, tell all Christians, be ready to be apologists for the glory of Jesus Christ. But I often tell people, <clears throat> it's not easy to defend a faith that we do not know. Because this assumes you know your faith, and you're living it out for the glory of Christ. So then when asked, you're ready. And he says, always be ready. <clears throat> and not when you feel like it. Always be ready. To whoever asks, yet do so. Now the NIV says, I believe, gentleness and respect. Actually, a better, and again, I'm not trying to Reverence. presume. Reverence, oh good. That's the updated NIV then. It's 2011? Okay, they changed it. Because the 1984, if you're wondering why I know so much about Bible translations, uh, I told you I got issues here. But in the 19 was always do it with gentleness and respect. So they changed it to reverence? Excellent. Excellent. Because here it's talking, talking about doing it out of reverence for Christ. Out of love for Christ. If you revere Christ and you love Him, then do this for His glory. And try to be gentle to whoever asks, unless the situation demands that you need to put someone in his place. And it's not true. I know a lot of Christians think that you can never be offensive. That's not true. There's a time and place for everything. Even a time and place to treat a fool according to his foolishness and put him in his place. And I'm not making this up. That's in Proverbs 26 verses 4 and 5. Let's go there. <laughs> I got to be careful because I don't want to use this to justify just attacking people. <laughs> right? Are you laughing at me? No, okay. <clears throat> Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. If you turn there, you're going to see what seems to be contradictory statements. You, it seems like the author is contradicting himself in a matter of two verses. Because if you go to Proverbs 26, verse 4, you're going to see, he says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you become like him. But the next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly. So which is it? Should I answer a fool or ignore a fool? Depending on the context, the situation. It's like Ecclesiastes 3, 1a. There's a time to love. There's a time to hate. There's a time for peace. So it depends on the individual and the situation. For the most part, ignore a fool. Don't stoop to his level. Don't be like him. But then there's a time in which you need to put a fool in his place and embarrass him for his foolishness. And the apostles in Christ didn't hesitate to put people in their place and insult them if necessary. Even our blessed Lord, when he was condemning people, you brood of vipers. Can you imagine walking to church and the first thing he said, you snake. You brood of viper. And by the way, how are you doing today? <laughs> There's a time and place for everything. And the Lord, when he was rebuking the self-righteous Pharisees and Sadducees, it says there were some lawyers that were offended. They go, teacher, you know you hurt us when you speak that way. And Jesus didn't say, oh, did I hurt you? I'm so sorry. I wasn't being Christ-like. I apologize. Let's see the Lord's reaction. Luke 11, 45 to 46. Right? And we'll come back to the apologetics. We'll talk about some issues that we need to grow as Christians. And if you have questions, write them down and feel free to ask me. Luke 11, 45 to 46. See how our Lord responded to those who were kind of sensitive to the way Jesus was rebuking people who deserved it. Luke 11, 45 to 46. And one of the lawyers said to him in reply, Teacher, you say this, you insult us too. Now, but notice his response isn't, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. I, was, I, I apologize. Notice what the Lord does. 
But he said, what do you like? What do you do? You don't like it? <laughs> but that's not being Christ-like, Jesus. Right? Let's see, Paul. I'm sorry. I'm having fun with this. Let's just one more. Acts 13, 6 to 12. How did Paul treat someone who is opposing the witness of the gospel, putting obstacles before the preaching of the gospel? How did Paul react? Acts 13, verses 6 to 12. Pay attention to verse 10. Acts 13, verse 6 to 10. We're going to go into apologize. Chapter 13, verses 6 to 12, Acts 13. Whoever wants to read, if you want to read, brother, feel free. Somebody else wants to read. Thank you, Alex, for chiming in. We appreciate that. Do you want to read, brother? Go ahead. When they had gone through the whole island to Papos, they found a certain sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar Jesus. Bar Jesus means son of Jesus, by the way, but go ahead. Who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Yes, keep going. But Alemus, the sorcerer, which is his name by interpretation, <clears throat> opposed them, trying to divert the pro council from the faith. And then notice Paul's reaction. And Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared at him and said, you son of the devil. So <laughs> as someone filled with the Holy Spirit, he called someone, you son of the devil? He was filled with the Spirit when he said that, right? So don't let anyone tell you otherwise that it's never right to put someone in his place. We can't be more Christian than Paul, and we can't be more loving than Jesus. There's a time and place for everything. But that's not the norm. The normal way of doing things is being gentle. But when it is time for it, you need to be passionate for the gospel and put people in their places. Especially when they're opposing the witness of the gospel, hindering people from getting saved. Amen. Filled with the Holy Spirit. What does he say? Finish it. Deuteronomy 12. I won't stop you. Enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit, and of all pride, who do not cease perverting the right way of the Lord. <clears throat> yes. And if you want to read all the way to 12, right? I mean, you're getting almost there. Now look, the hand of the Lord is against you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. Man. And then what happens to him? Does his words come to pass? Immediately mist and darkness fell on him. And he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Yeah, so what Paul said happened, right? Filled with the Spirit. Here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to be blind. Because that's what you are. You're spiritually blind, so now you're going to be physically blind. For opposing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So guys, don't get me angry. Be careful. Because you don't want me to now start. No, okay. Okay, let's go to Philippians 1. Let's go back to apologetics. Philippians 1. I'll give you a few more passages to reinforce the fact that we're called to do apologetics. We're called... To give a defense for the hope that's within us. To whoever asks it, do so with gentleness and reverence. Philippians chapter 1. It's verse 7, but if you go to Philippians 1, we'll read 6 and 7. Paul is writing this from jail. The context is he's writing this from jail. He wrote several letters from jail. And he's going to talk about two groups of people preaching the gospel for two different reasons. And before we get to those reasons, first I want you to see what he says in Philippians 1, 6 to 7, particularly verse 7. Philippians 1, 6 to 7. You want to read? Whoever wants to read? And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's our confidence, right? He began a work and he'll complete it and preserve us for the glory of Jesus Christ. My confidence is not in you enduring. My confidence is in Jesus preserving you. Because if the Lord leaves it up to me, there I go. Holy Spirit, never leave me never let me go because without you i can't do it and so my confidence is god will complete it will bring you to completion and maturity and preserve you until the day of jesus christ now verse 7 is the key it is right for me to feel this way about you all because i hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Can anyone guess what the word defense is in the original language? Because it's written in Greek. Apologia. It's apologia. apologia. I am in prison because I'm an apologist confirming the gospel. That's why they threw me in jail. They threw me in jail for doing the work of apologetics. It's the word. Don't take my word for it. Get any lexicon. Or if you can read the Greek New Testament, you'll see it's the word apologia. It's there. So Paul is saying, I'm in prison. Because I'm an apologist confirming the gospel. Right? 
Same chapter, same chapter. Now, depending on what translation you read, the King James, in the King James, it's verse 17. Other translations is verse 16. So I don't know if someone has the King James. If you have the King James, it will be verse 17. But if you have another translation, it's verse 16. Now, just to give you a little context, because we're catching again in mid-sentence. Mid, mid He's talking about two groups of Christians that preach the gospel. One do do it because they've been motivated by Paul's example. They got emboldened by Paul's example. Wow! Paul went to jail for the gospel. Man, if he can do it, I can do it too. Another group does it out of envy to spite Paul. They hate Paul. They're envious of Paul. And they're preaching it in order to add to Paul's misery. Make him more miserable in jail. And you know what I love about Paul? He goes, even that group, I don't care if that's their motive. Because people are getting saved in spite of it. Do you see his heart? This man is preaching to spite me. He's in competition to me. But little does he realize, even though that's his motive, he's getting people saved and that's all that matters. Amen. Man, I hope you keep hating me to the point that you preach to millions. <laughs> if that motivates you, get them saved. Because God's going to deal with your motive on the day of judgment. Right now, you're getting people saved. That's all that matters to me. People are falling in love with my Jesus. What a man of God. So in that context, he says in verse 16. In that context, he says... Let's read it. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Can you guess what the word defense is again? Oh, yeah. I'm in jail because I'm an apologist for Jesus Christ. It's part and parcel of your witness, evangelism, to do apologetics. In fact, many of the books of the New Testament were written to defend the gospel. They're apologetic treatises. Galatians is an entire book defending the true gospel against false gospels. So Galatians is apologetic in nature. And by way of testimony, you don't need to be a scholar. You just have to trust the Holy Spirit to fill you. And I am a living testament of that. Never been to college or seminary. Let me encourage you. I will boast in my foolishness to encourage you on how real Jesus is. And that if you trust, he will fill you with wisdom to confound the world. I didn't learn this from seminary. I didn't learn this from any professor. Trusting the Spirit to guide me, that's where I got this from. The same Spirit that lives in you and loves you and wants to glorify Christ through you. But you have to trust. Amen. You have to trust. If you really believe He's real, He's so real, He will open your mouth to speak wonders to confound the world so they fall at the feet of King Jesus. And we're in good company. Even the prophets knew they were not qualified. Jeremiah, he says, I'm a child. The Lord appeared to him. He goes, I'm a child. He says, do not say you are a child. I will put my words in your mouth. And I will be with you. But you have to trust. And many people, though they say they trust, they don't trust enough. The Lord says, trust. And I will open your mouth with the wisdom to confound your enemies. But do you believe? It's like one of my favorite passages of scripture. I love this scripture. It always comforts me. Especially when my mother passed away. This passage came to my mind. And again, if I, if, if you, if I get moved, bear, you know, bear with me. It's just, just the scriptures, it's beautiful. Everything, you know, just, it touches a person's heart who's touched by the spirit. Jesus comes to Martha and... <clears throat> This passage came to my mind as they were lowering the body of my mother. Excuse me. The Lord looked at Martha and he said to her, your brother shall rise. John 11, 23. She goes, I know, Lord, you'll rise at the last day of the day of resurrection. And Jesus looks at her and says, I am the resurrection and the life. You don't have to wait. It's here. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who believes and lives shall never die. But he didn't stop there. He looked at it and says, do you believe this? See, that's the key. Do you believe this? See, Jesus knows who he is. I am life itself. But do you believe it? And then she responded. Yes, Lord. 
I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. He was to come into the world. So Jesus is saying, do you believe me enough to trust me? To take that step and know that I'll be with you and I will do wonders through you. But do you believe enough to trust me? All right, so we're in good company. Even Moses tried to bargain his way out of He's like, I got, you know, I got a speech impediment. Oh, gee, I'm shocked. I didn't know Moses. He caught me by surprise. Darn it. Wrong guy. He goes, who made man's mouth? He says, who do you think I made you this way? So that the glory won't be yours, it will be mine. That I can even take someone with a physical ailment and do wonders through him and her. Even someone with a physical ailment. I can do wonders through him and her, so the glory won't be yours, it will be mine. That I can do all things through those who trust in me. Right? That was John 11. Right? So Paul was no pushover. Right? He can dish it out and take it. Right? But one thing I want you to learn from Paul's habit. His habit was to use the scriptures to prove Messiah would die and rise again. Historically at this time, what scriptures was he appealing to? At this time in history, we didn't have the New Testament. But the Old Testament, right? Isaiah's one. But the Hebrew scriptures. Now, here's a question, and it's not a question I want you to answer out loud. Some of you already know where to go when you said Isaiah. Specifically, Isaiah 53. <clears throat> the question is, can we do what Paul does? Could I go to a local synagogue here in Florida and ask the rabbi to let me prove from the Hebrew Bible Messiah would die for the sins of the people and be raised on the third day and to prove that Jesus is the Messiah? Because Paul could do it. Why can't we? So this is a question we need to ask and answer. Because we have the same scriptures Paul had, and we have now the New Testament to help us understand the Hebrew scriptures. And we have the same spirit filling Paul that fills us. So we should be able to do it, especially when it's commanded, you need to do it. When a Jew tells you, there is no such thing as a di dying and rising Messiah. You won't find it in the Hebrew Bible. Yes, I can. No, but that's misinterpreted. The Hebrew doesn't say this. Yes, it does. There is no concept of a God-man in the Hebrew Bible. Where does my Bible say that Messiah is God? Doesn't exist, he's just a man. Sure there are prophecies where it says the son of David is God in the flesh. Show me! And just, again, just to play devil's advocate, let me say Jewish advocate or Muslim advocate, I don't like to say devil's advocate. What passage in the Hebrew Bible would we quote to prove that the Messiah, the son of David, is God in the flesh? What passage in the Hebrew Bible you, I don't want you to answer because you're an apologist. No cheating for you, buddy. Especially when you just did an interview with me. Well, you don't mind, right? I'm no, no, no. Right yeah, after he says that, the way you looked at me, of course I don't. <laughs> I don't want the fury of the great city of Nineveh fall upon me. <laughs> what passage in the Hebrew Bible could we point to to prove that the Messiah to come is more than a man, he's God in the flesh? Because that's one of the objections. Not only an objection raised by Jews who don't believe in Jesus. That's an objection raised by Muslims. Because I've been dealing with Muslims since the late, no, mid-90s, early 90s. Got into full-time ministry in 1999. That's one of the objections. The Hebrew Bible doesn't agree with Christianity. It actually agrees with the Quran. Many Muslims think that the concept of God in the Old Testament actually <clears throat> agrees with the Quran over against the New Testament. Because Muslims believe that God is a singular person, not just a singular being, right? They're what we call Unitarians. The one God, Allah, we'll talk about him in a little bit, is a singular person. They don't use the term person, but that's their conception. And the Old Testament God was a singular person as well. He was not a trinity. You Christians are the odd man out. Jews agree with us. There is no trinity. You're idolaters. So what passage, do we have a passage in the Hebrew Bible that we can cite to show that Messiah is God in the flesh? Beautiful. Yeah. Dan, so, uh, no, uh, you, did you hear it somewhere? Yeah. Daniel 7, 13 and 14, the Son of Man. <laughs> Powerful. Praise God. See, this is a good church. These guys know to do apologetics, man. I've trained them. Yeah, have you? <laughs> so it's good in spite of Alex. You're proved that even good things can come from bad things. Okay. Yes, and that's the next one. Unpack it. That's one. Excellent. Excellent passage. For the sake of time, does someone have another example? I saw someone's hand raised. Exodus 3. Like, the angel of the Lord? No, when oh. God calls, like, I am that I am, and Jesus calls himself that I am. Not in the New Testament where Jesus claims to be God. They want in the Old Testament uh, where Messiah said to be God. 
The Messiah said to be God. In the Old Testament, because they don't care about the New Testament. Isaiah 9. Excellent. Yes. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, or Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Sorry, skip that title. He shall be called, notice the names given to the child, a child born. And notice the names given to the child. And boy, did the Jews try to explain this away. Boy, did they try to explain this away. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Mighty God, that's an important title because it's only used one other time in the book of Isaiah. I want you guys to turn to Isaiah 9-6 and we're going to cross-reference. And then we're going to begin asking more specific questions. And I'll let you ask me questions. We're going to go into some of the things we need to know as Christians. Because we need to know them because we're Christians. And we need to know them because people are going to ask, why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? Why don't you believe this? Why believe the Bible? Why not the Vedas? We need to be prepared. But in Isaiah 9, 6, the mighty God, I wanted to use a cross-reference to show you that this is a powerful witness to the deed of Christ. And then a brother here wanted to ask me so or make a statement. Go to Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. As in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, a child born who's the mighty God. Now go to Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. So the Lord is the mighty God, right? That's what it said right there. Can you go to 9 6 real quickly? Because now I'm really confused. Because in 9 6, what were we told about the mighty God? In chapter 9, verse 6, what are we told about the mighty God? For to, uh, yes, that's the one. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Okay, now you baffled me. A child is born who's the mighty God? So the mighty God will be born as a baby? But Isaiah 10 told me that mighty God is Jehovah. So you're telling me Isaiah said Jehovah will be born as a baby? A God baby? A God man? But I thought that's New Testament teaching. Why is that in the Old Testament? You Christians, uh, every book that falls into your hand, you just make it sound Trinitarian. What's going on here, right? So yes, we need to be prepared to give these kind of answers when objections rise. Now, brother, you had a question here? You had a question you had to raise your hand? Okay, okay. So these are some of the things that we need to know. And so basically, as apologists, we need to be grounded on who and what God is. So I'm going to tell you the things we're going to talk about. And you know what Paul says? Be careful because even Satan's ministers masquerade as ministers of righteousness. That's part of his deception. Same chapter, 2 Corinthians 11, read 13 and 15. So don't be swayed by a person's demeanor or dress. That's part of the satanic deception. Don't be swayed with a sharp-looking guy in a suit, clean-shaped and very humble. Because Satan knows that if he gives you straight-up poison, he won't take it. But if he gives you a plate of M&Ms, unless you're on a diet, you're going to run for it, right? <laughs> Little do you realize, in the center of the M&M lie the poison. Covered up. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15, he says it right there. What does he say? For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. There is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. Pause there. They don't come promoting evil or immorality. They come promoting humility, love, holiness, purity, Submitting to the law of Christ. See, that's how Satan works. But if you know the Bible, he cannot deceive you. That's why when someone tells me, pray Jesus, or I say, all right, amen, what Jesus? <laughs> Who is the Jesus you're praising? Praise the Father. Hey, all right, what Father? What God? Yeah, because Paul tells me, be aware. Someone says, thank you, Jesus. Hey, I thank Jesus too, but is your Jesus the God-man? Is your Jesus the eternal Son who existed in intimate fellowship and love with the Father before creation, who then became man, 
Is the Holy Spirit that you do you believe in a distinct person from the Father and the Son? One with them in essence, but different in person. So that these three love one another, communicate one another, even before creation? If you say yes, then that's the first part. All right, that part you got, okay. What about the gospel? How are you saved? What about the gospel? Because Paul tells me, don't put up with a different gospel. Don't accept a different spirit. Don't believe in another Jesus. But here's the problem, folks. If you don't know what the Bible teaches about Jesus, how can you spot a counterfeit one? If you do not know who the Holy Spirit is, how do you know this person is preaching by the power of a false spirit? And the reason why it's relevant, assemblies of God speak in tongues. They speak in tongues too. By what spirit? They don't have the same God. Let me share it again. One of the signs of this church that you're saved is that you got to speak in tongues. And they speak in tongues, but they have a different God. By what spirit do they speak in tongues? If you say it's the same spirit, that's blasphemy because they have a different God. An evil spirit, which means that even Satan can mimic the gift of tongues to deceive you into thinking, hey, wait, he speaks in tongues, I speak in tongues. He's got to be a true Christian. That's another trick of the enemy. I don't care how many tongues you speak. Who is your Jesus? Because if your Jesus is other than the Jesus that Paul preached, that's Satan speaking through you, not the Holy Spirit of the living God. But because we get emotional, he speaks in tongues, he's got to be a brother. Who said that's the sign of being a true Christian? Did Paul make that the criterion to know a true Christian from a false one? No. What Jesus do you preach? By what spirit do you prophesy? And what is the gospel? Well, if you get these right, then we can talk about the rest. Right? So remember, this is what you need to grow in. This is what you need to know. Who is Jesus? How do we know? Who is the spirit? What is the spirit? What is the gospel? And we'll take, I'll bring up some objections. We'll talk about it. But my, my field is mostly dealing with the authority of the Bible and the core doctrines of the Christian faith. You have others who are raised specifically for secular issues. Also, traditional marriage, atheism. You have giants in the field. God has raised up to deal with that. One of the most brilliant men dealing with atheism and refuting it is William Lane Craig. That man is amazing. He's a spiritual giant. So God is good. He raises up people to deal with all these issues. But not, we, not, you won't find one individual who excels in every issue, right? I mean, my field will be Islam. His field will be atheism. But that's the beauty of being a body. We're all interdependent. We all have different gifts. So you're going to need my gift in this area. I'm going to need your gift in that area. That's how it works. We're a body. So I may know about Joe's witnesses, but I may not know much about atheism. Alex knows about atheism. Hey, Alex, I got an atheist. I can't respond. Can you come? Sure, brother. That's his calling. And then Alex calls me and says, there's a Joe witness on my house. See, that's how we work. So that no one man gets all the attention. That's another reason why God doesn't give all the gifts to one man. So he doesn't become the center of attention. So they believe Jesus is a Muslim, apostles are Muslim. So one of the challenges often raised, <clears throat> Abraham's a Muslim. In fact, in the Quran it says in chapter 3, verse 67 of the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 67 of the Quran, it says, Abraham is neither a Jew nor a Christian. Abraham is neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he's an upright Muslim. He's a, he was an upright Muslim. Now you're like, what? Abraham's a Muslim? What, are you crazy? Well, hold on. Here's a question. Did Abraham seek to submit his will to the one God? Did he try to? I mean, he did it imperfectly, but was that his desire and goal in life? Submit myself to the one God? Yeah. Did he do that? Yeah. Yes? You just admit he's a Muslim because that's what a Muslim is. One who submits to one God. So why you got a problem with it? It's okay, but he's still that one God submits to him, right? Muslim submits to the one God. Abraham submits to the one God. Ergo, he's a Muslim. Don't hate, just accept the fact. All right. <laughs> Obviously, we don't believe he's a Muslim. If he's a Muslim, then we're in the wrong place. We need to go to the local mosque. He's not a Muslim. But the Quran says he's not a Jew, nor was he a Christian. So here's the first challenge. Here's the first challenge. What was the religion of Abraham, and what was the religion of the apostles of Jesus Christ? Oh. Please don't say they, don't, they didn't have religion. I don't have religion. I have relationship. No, you have both. James 1, 26, 27 says, There's a pure religion before God. And the pure religion before God is this. James 1, 26, 27. Keep yourselves undefiled from the world. 
and visit the orphans and the widows. That's a religion that God loves. And that's a religion that God wants you to partake in. You do have religion. I know it's preaching. I don't have religion. I have relationship. <laughs> it's preachy, I know. It's not biblical. You have a religion and you have a relationship. It's not either or. It's both and. Right? So that's because I just wanted to shortcut that argument. I don't have religion, sir. No, I do what was, what was the name of, what was, what was Abraham as far as his religion is concerned? What was he religiously? The, the Quran says he's not a Jew and he's not a Christian. So what was he? Forget the Quran now. I'm saying as a Christian, what do we say? Okay, but would you say he's a, he was a Christian monotheist or a Jew? I mean, what do you mean monotheist? Say it again. One God. Well, that's Islam. See, now you're arguing the Muslim case. Please, Christian, help me. <coughs> Refute Islam. Was he a Jew? He started Jew. Thank you. A lot of people say he's a Jew. He's not. He's the father of the Jews. So if you're using as an ethnic moniker, he's he's a, he's he's not a Jew. But if you're saying in the religious sense, because his religion is a religion of Judaism, then why do you Christians claim him as one of your own if he's if he's Jewish religiously? If you're saying he's Jewish religiously, you're saying he's not a Christian. So then why are you claiming him as one of your own? Before you answer that, what does Christian mean? Disciple of Jesus, right? What's the definition of Christian? A follower of Christ, right? If you believe in the Bible, and I know you do, if you believe in the Bible, Abraham was a Christian. Not saying he knew the name. Not saying he called himself Christian. But if Christian means a follower of Christ, Jesus said Abraham was a Christian because he trusted in me. Let's go to John 8, 39, 40. Now you're going to see the word of God. Now you're going to say, wow. This is going to be one of those wow moments. Right? I hope it is. Maybe I'm, I, it's a wow moment to me and maybe not to you. But according to the New Testament, they were all Christians. And it's the New Testament that informs us what to believe and why we should. So if they're telling you they all believed in Jesus, by golly, they were Christians. I'm not saying they knew the name. But they're definitely not Muslims and they're not Jews religiously. They definitely were not Jews ethnically because to be a Jew means from the tribe of Judah. Abraham's the father of Judah. How can he be a Jew? Is he his own descendant? Doesn't work. But maybe in, in modalism it works, right? He manifested as a I'm just kidding. <laughs> Inside like Ishmael was a Jew too. Thank you. You mean Ishmael wasn't a Jew? No, I'm playing with you. The reason why he mentioned Ishmael is because Muslims boast that Ishmael is the father of Muhammad. Muhammad is the prophet of Islam. And his connection to Abraham is that he's the descendant of Ishmael, the son of Abraham. So they claim Ishmael's the father of Muhammad, therefore he's tied in with Abraham. Biblically and historically, there's no proof for that assertion. And Muhammad was not a son of Ishmael. He was not, biblically and historically. But I'll talk about that a little later. John 8, 39 to 40. Let's see who's going to catch this. John 8, 39 to 40. Whoever's going to read it, read it for me. Abraham is our father. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. Big pause right there. He's trying to prove that you don't really belong to Abraham. I don't care that you're physically descended from him. Because what matters to God is not your physical descendancy or ancestry, but your spiritual lineage. You can be a physical son of Abraham and still go to hell. And you can be a Gentile and Abraham be your true father. So he's trying to prove to them, physically you're, you're sons of Abraham, but you're not truly his sons. Because if you're truly his sons, you're going to act like him. But now you're trying to kill me, a man who stole you truth from God. Abraham did not do these things. What did Abraham not do? Angel of the Lord, yes, but that's not the only time Jesus shows up to Abraham as angel of the Lord. He shows up under different names to Abraham. I want to get there. But you guys got the connection first. Mm -hmm. You're trying to kill me. Abraham didn't try to do this. Now, if I was there, I'd ask the question. What do you mean Abraham didn't try to do this? What are you trying to apply? We're trying to kill you, and he didn't try to do that? Are you saying that Abraham didn't try to kill you? You're not even 50 years old. What are you talking about? Abraham's been dead. And then he confirms. That's exactly his point. Because in John 8, 56 to 59. Just to let you know, I'm not reading into the text. I'm just bringing out the meaning of the text. John 8, 56 to 59. I love this. What is this? Oh, the microphone? 
I thought you were saying take a sip of coffee, right? John 8, 50, because he keeps doing this. Your father Abraham rejoiced at seeing my day. He saw it was glad. Right there, I'd scratch my head again. My father Abraham rejoiced at seeing your day. He saw it was glad. My father's been dead for 2,000 years. So then they asked him in 57, you're not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? Yeah. Notice how they understood him. You mean you saw Abraham to know how he reacted? Now, Jesus could have corrected them if they're wrong. No, no, guys, I'm, that's not what I mean. I mean, God revealed to Abraham I was coming, which is true. God did reveal that the Messiah is coming. But he actually confirms they got it right. Yeah, I did see him. Here's why. 58. Truly, truly, I say it to you. Before Abraham came to, into being, I am. You know what he means? Don't let my physical appearance mislead you. I'm much older than 50. I'm older than your father. Because unlike your father who was created, I've always been. And there comes the stones. I am. I've always been. I was there even before your father was born. And that's why I could see him face to face. But hold on, folks. If Jesus said Abraham saw me and was happy to see me. No, that's got to be a typo. No, that, that can't be in your Bible. There's no way. Wait, wait. David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> Read verse 30 one more time. Uh, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. Can't be possible. It's not possible for a man a thousand years before Jesus is born to know about Jesus' death and resurrection. Impossible to man, not to the Holy Spirit. Amen. To man, not to the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. Amen. But do you understand the implication of that? David spoke of the resurrection of Christ. How can he speak of a resurrection without believing in it? So David spoke of, knew, and believed in the resurrection of the Messiah? And David spoke of, confessed Jesus is Lord? So wait, wait, wait. You're telling me David confessed Jesus is Lord and believed in his heart that God will raise him from the dead? No wonder he was saved. Did you guys catch it? <laughs> Romans 10, 9. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. David said, Messiah is my Lord, and God has raised him from the dead and enthroned him at his right hand. David was a Christian. He was no Jew. <laughs> but it gets a little even more amazing because I want you to catch the word. He wasn't, he didn't simply receive revelation, Messiah would be raised. He saw it in advance. Read it again. He foresaw and spoke of the resurrection. You asked me to read it again? Verse 30. Oh, sorry. Okay. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. Keep on. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. He foresaw. He saw in advance the resurrection of Christ. You know what that means, saints? God showed him Jesus being raised from the dead. Wow. No wonder he got a man after God's own heart, you know? <laughs> you know what's amazing about that? Even the apostles didn't see Jesus leave the tomb. They got there, the tomb was empty. The Holy Spirit showed David what even the apostles did not see. Wow. Is that before or after he wrote Psalm 51? That That's a good question. We don't even know. I mean, historically, so we know that he wrote that after adultery, but Psalm 110, I don't know. That's a good question. We need to investigate. But every any date would be speculative, right? Because he doesn't come out and say this date. But we know Psalm 51 is after the incident of adultery. But was Psalm 110 before or after? We don't know. But good thing is, even if it's before or after, the blood of Jesus covers his sins. Amen. That was his hope. He knew I'm not saved by my righteousness. That one, that one is my Lord. That one who's been raised, he will cover my sins. And because of him, my sins will not be counted against me. Wow. Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2. David was a Christian before Jesus was born. 
Abraham was a Christian before Jesus was born. They were all Christians before Jesus was born, if you believe in the New Testament. <laughs> if you believe in the New Testament. If you believe Jesus is the Word who created all things, He's the only one in history who can say, I'm older than my mother, and I created her and chose her to be my mother. <laughs> you know that, right? Yeah. If He's the Word who made all things, He... And that's amazing. The time came where the Father and the Holy Spirit says, Son, the time is coming for you to become man. It's time for us to create your mother. And he's the one who's fashioning his mother in the womb. He's the one who's seeing his mother being born. He's the one who's watching over his mother grow and mature. And when she's ready, it's now time for me to go down into that blessed womb. He was watching her. Molding her. Preserving her. And he set her apart to be his mother. Yeah. Aren't you glad he came into the womb? Yeah. And left the tomb empty? That's why when we see the grave, we can laugh at it. Where is your sting? My Lord has conquered you. And I will live because he lives. But let's complete it now. She read 31. Keep reading. Now start 31 again. Read 31. All the way to 36. We'll be done. Or to 35. Read 31. Well, yeah, all the way to 36. Go ahead. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. He didn't get it! <laughs> when Jesus, before, hold on, I'm your sister, no. side, sister. <laughs> don't worry, it's like you're rushing for the rapture, but please don't leave us behind. <laughs> <laughs> you guys didn't get it! Hold on, wait, 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 you didn't get it! His flesh did not see corruption. Implication? When God raised Jesus, he raised him in his flesh, and his flesh is now incorruptible. <clears throat> I don't think you're getting it still. If you believe what you just read, that means our Jesus is in heaven with a body of flesh. Hallelujah. <laughs> our Jesus is in heaven with a flesh body that's incorruptible. You know why that's amazing? All who have died in Christ, in Hebrews 12, 23, we're told they are spirits of just men made perfect. Their bodies went to the dust. But there's one among them, and only one, who has a body of glorified flesh. And he's sitting on that throne in that physical body. You know what that means? David is now seeing his descendant in that physical body that he took from his blessed mother, that made him a son of David. And he goes, that's my son, who is also my God. My God has become my son, and my son is my God. And I bow to him. Here's my Lord. If you believe in the New Testament. It all goes back to, do you believe this? Amen. Lord Jesus, we believe, and we will never doubt. Now keep reading. Did hey, David know? Hebrews what? 12 what? Hebrews 12, 23. But you need, you need to read 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, it talks about heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, myriads of angels, God, the judge of all, <clears throat> the church of the firstborn, and the spirits of just men made perfect. And then it says, not only will you see them in heaven, but you will also see Jesus, who is a mediator of a better covenant. So Jesus is there, and all these spirits are there, and the angels are there, and the angels are saying, wow, our God is now in the flesh. Now you understand what that means? When he left heaven... He left that spirit. When he came back, he came back in the flesh. I, I can only imagine the reaction of heaven when the angel saw it. Mm. Lord, something's different about you. <laughs> when you were here, you didn't have a flesh body. What happened, Lord? What happened is my creation fell and I went to redeem them. My love moved me to become one of them and to identify with them. And out of my love... I will always be one of them. Amen. That's the price he paid. He says, why well, save him? This book, whew, this book can kill a person, right? I mean, just, you know. If you don't understand what that means, I don't know. I'm sure, I'm want, I want you, by the Holy Spirit, to fall more madly in love with Jesus. That's the goal of every true Bible teacher. His goal is to be used by the Spirit to make you fall in love with Jesus even more. If you believe what you read, and you do, he's flesh. When Jesus showed himself to Thomas, you can write this down, I won't turn there. John 20, 24 to 29. John 20, 24 to 29. 
Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared. And he goes, listen, unless I put my hands in the holes of the nails in his, in my, my finger in the holes of the, of the nails in his hands and touch his side, I won't believe. So I won't believe. I don't care if you believe. I'm not, I'm not naive. Dead men don't come to life. I won't believe. It says eight days later, doors were locked. Remember, Jesus wasn't there physically, right? He wasn't there. Eight days later, doors were locked. Jesus shows up. Now, when you read the Bible, put yourself there, right? So when Jesus shows up, it's not like, hey, Jesus, good to see you. It's like, hey, right? Imagine what would happen. You're talking and a guy shows out of nowhere and the doors are locked. Hey, man. Because they're not, oh, good to see you, man. Oh, let me finish my conversation with the pastor. And then he says, he goes, peace be unto you. And then right away, without asking, he goes, Thomas, come. No. See that? No. Thomas, come. Put your finger in my hands. And come and touch me. Touch my side. It is I. Stop doubting and start believing. And Thomas' reaction, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, have you seen and believed? Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. Blessed are you who can love Jesus without having to see him physically in front of your eyes. But do you understand what Jesus was saying to Thomas and what he's saying to us? Folks, my body still bears the marks of the cross that I paid to save you. That means Jesus' body of flesh, it's not just glorified, it forever has the holes of the nails and the hole of the spear as an everlasting reminder. This is the price I pay to save you because I love you. This is the price I paid. I knew if I was to redeem you, I'd have to take a body of flesh. And I knew if I was to redeem you, I would have to be beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, having spikes driven in my hands and in my ankles, and a spear thrust. I knew this was the price I'd have to pay. And then I knew to show you that I conquered death, I would have to rise in that body, proving that death has been destroyed by my resurrection. And I knew that if I rose in that body forever, I would have a body that I'm limited to with the holes in my hands and the hole in my side and in my ankles. And you know what? I did it anyway, because that's how much I love you. You were worth it. You were worth it. That's why I did it. So forever, we're going to see that. When Jesus stretches out to hug you, when he comes to hug you, you know you're going to see? A reminder, this is how much I love you. And these arms that sustain creation will sustain you forever and ever. And nothing will separate you from my love. Nothing. Not even death. No wonder they call him the Savior. Emmanuel, God with us. But with David, did he see that? Of course he saw that. Not only that, he wrote about it. Now let's go to Acts 2. Let's finish it. 32 to 36. And we'll open up the q and I'm done. Acts 2. I told you, when the Holy Spirit takes over, even grown men will cry, right? You know, you have that song, Big Girls Don't Cry? Big girls don't cry. Well, I guess big boys do. But anyway. Acts 2. Let's read. We're going to pick it up to the 32. Let's read the 36 and then q and Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses being therefore of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing for David did not ascend into the heavens but he himself says the Lord said to my Lord sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool wait so Peter is saying that David knew that Jesus would ascend to heaven to sit at God's right hand is that what he just quoted? Mm -hmm. Notice 35, uh, 34, 35. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he wrote. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. David knew his Lord Messiah not only would die, but be raised to life and taken into heaven to sit at God's right hand. And that is my Lord. Wait, David, you're saying Messiah Jesus is your Lord? He's my Lord. You're saying God will raise him from dead? I saw it. God raised him from the dead. You're saying Jesus, your Lord, will sit in throne with the Father in heaven? Absolutely. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God will raise him from the dead, you shall be saved. David confessed and wrote, He is my Lord. God raised him from the dead, and he sits in throne at the right hand of God. And you're telling me David was religiously a Jew and not a Christian. 
So what was their religion? Jesus says, they were all followers of me. They were Christians because they knew of me, they trusted in me, they hoped in me, they loved me, and knew and desired to see me coming in the flesh to save them from the wrath to come. And David wrote about it. Wow, that's my descendant that's coming back to life. But he's also my Lord, so God will become one of my sons. Because that's what it means. He's a descendant of David, right? But he's also David's Lord. Sources that say the Jews understood that this Messiah would actually come from heaven. For example, I mentioned the book of Enoch, right? The book of Enoch is a Jewish book written before the time of Christ. And in that book, if you go to chapters 46 to 48, the author or authors of that book claim that the Messiah is a heavenly being, the Son of Man, the Chosen One, the Messiah, a heavenly being who existed with God before creation, who would appear in the latter times and sit on a throne of glory and everyone would worship him. And that's a Jewish source. You see how much they got right? A Jewish source, you know, the man of Daniel, the chosen one of God. He exists with God before the creation of the world. When he comes, he'll sit on a throne of glory and all the nations will worship him. Boy, they got a lot right. Well, where do they get this from? From the Old Testament. So when you say Jews, well, even like today, even back then, not everyone sees the same thing when they read the same source. It's even today. I mean, don't, don't put the Jews like, do we Christians agree on everything? You get two Christians, you get 50 opinions. <laughs> but if you want to know your interpretation is right, just believe anything and everything I write, then you're... <laughs> <laughs> All right, but yeah, so the answer to the question, they knew about a coming Savior and Messiah. They knew that. But did they all agree on every detail about the Messiah? No, there were differences. But that doesn't mean that the Old Testament prophets didn't know. They knew. But, and not every prophet knew everything. Whatever God made known to about the Messiah, they believed. And we see a progression of revelation. But one thing we, we can agree on is that they all knew about the Messiah. That he was coming and he would be their savior. Luke 10, 23, 24. That would be it. Whoever wants to read it, I don't have it. Want to read it, brother? You got it? Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now go to Luke 24, 44 to 47. Let me give you references. See, I could be here all day giving you the references. This is what they all believe. So unless we have a different authority from the New Testament, then we have to agree with Jesus and the apostles. They all wrote about him. They all spoke about him. They all knew he was coming. I'm not saying all of them were given the same details. Mm -hmm. But all of them were told, he's coming. He's your savior. Trust in him. What was the next one? Luke what? Luke 24, 44, 47. 24, 44. 44 to 47. Then he said to them, these are I should suffer on the third day. Rise. Wait, you mean it's written in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms? Christ would suffer and rise on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Okay, here's my prayer's witness to him. Right. Right?